Hi everyone, this GP Spirit face-to-face -face will be a bit different as we won't talk about the MotoGP itself, but still I will talk with a person who is deeply involved in MotoGP. He is Michele Zaza, Medical Director of uh, Clinica Mobile, uh, but also during his normal daily life he is a practicing uh, doctor and anesthetist. So you can imagine uh, how busy uh, he is uh, nowadays with the, with the coronavirus pandemic in Italy. Precisely, he is in Parma. So I know that we are all uh, full of information about the coronavirus and what's going on. But uh, still, I think it's a verse to, to listen to him and uh, listen to his words. Uh, hi Michele, thanks a lot for uh, joining to, to my YouTube channel. Um, so first of all, who doesn't know that you are the medical director of uh, Clinica Mobile, uh, responsible also for MotoGP, but you guys also working clearly on the Verse Superbike uh, series, but we can see you every time on the track when we have the, the MotoGP races. Um, so first of all, I was fully surprised when I saw the article that uh, Paolo Janieri uh, did with you for Gazzetta dello Sport. Um, my first question is that also in normal circumstances, let's say, are you still practicing as a doctor when you were at home and not in the, in the MotoGP paddock? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, I'm a doctor, so when we are not having a race, uh, I work back in Italy as an anesthesiology and a pre-hospital emergency doctor. So this is my usual uh, job uh, the, and I want to keep this, uh, my professionality, let's say, out of the paddock world. And this mm -hmm. is what we usually do also during the normal season, let's say. So yes, this is nothing different from what I was doing before, although everything is different now. Sure. So that would uh, be my second question. What exactly are you doing now with this uh, coronavirus pandemic and this situation? Uh, it's kind of an emergency call number, no? This, uh, yes, uh, like in some countries it's called uh, 911. We have a rapid response vehicle equipped uh, with a lot of medical equipment plus a doctor and a nurse. And in the most ca serious cases, we go and we attend the patient uh, at their place, uh, in the street. The idea is uh, to stay and play, as they say, different from other countries where they have the so-called philosophy of scoop and run. So we go there with the doctor and the nurse. We try to do the first manoeuvres, uh, resuscitative manoeuvres uh, on site, and then we move the patient to the uh, to the hospital where you could, they can have the definitive treatment. So this is uh, a service which is working in many countries uh, uh, in the same way. You have doctors going with, with the rapid response vehicles, helicopter or whatever on site to attend the patient on site. Um, well, no, when I'm back at home, the, I'm, I'm still doing this. So when I'm not in the paddock, I basically work as an anesthesiologist for elective surgeries in a private hospital. But these surgeries now are stopped because of this emergency. And I also work as a doctor for pre-hospital emergency services. So this is what I, I have already been doing for years. And this is what I normally do when I'm at home. How many cases or, or how many calls do you have a day? And just let, let's talk about now in, in your region or I think Parma precisely, Parma. right? Yes, Parma now is one of the city most hit by the by this emergency. And uh, it depends, I would say in a day in, in a day you can have from six to ten calls. And most of them are because of this coronavirus emergency. Most of them are for patients with a suspected infection of coronavirus. And compared to the normal services, we have more calls because usually it's a bit less. Uh, plus the, the length of a service, the length of, uh, of a job, let's say, when we are called, 
it's more they are longer because when you when you get access to the house of the patient you need to cover yourself and to protect yourself with a severe a strict procedure and then especially when the service is up when you have finished the, the work because you have moved the, the patient to the hospital you need to take care particularly care for when you undress because this is a very dangerous time in which you can get infected so you need to follow a procedure to get undressed and this is very uh, stressing as well because for us it's very stressing to pay a lot of attention every time of the day when you dress when you attend the patient when you undress you always need to take care not to do any stupid thing because if you do a stupid thing this can kill you can kill you can infect you or potentially harm you and how are how are the shifts so i don't know you work let's say two days and then you have a break or variables because i have uh, elderly doctors who at this stage prefer not to work and I fully understand them because they are more subject to this virus. Plus, I have two colleagues who got infected and now cannot work. They are at home with a pneumonia. Yeah, this is a part of the job, the risk. So uh, I would say that uh, every day, I'm, today I'm off. Uh, it's the first day I'm off since I would say 10 days. Uh, and uh, usually I do six hour shift or a 12 hour shift, depending on the day. So every day from six to 12 hours. Plus now we are trying to arrange uh, another kind of service for the many patients who are at home and uh, cannot be attended by the family doctor because also many family doctors now are, are sick, got infected, and in any case, they are overwhelmed with many, many patients. So in order to try to get to them at home and to try to help them at home or to give just a basic evaluation also to perhaps explain to them that the situation is not uh, that serious so for them it's better to stay at home rather than going to the hospital. What was the the worst uh, case that you uh, seen or you've experienced in this last couple I of weeks? I cannot say a single case because they are all uh, really uh, difficult but these are uh, patients who are not uh, breathing very well a patient who in two or three hours can get worse, potentially can die in two hours. Uh, even people who are uh, totally okay before this emergency. Uh, they say that they, it's 80 elderly people, like 80 year old people. It's not like this, even 70, even 60. In the last week, we also saw many 60 year old, 50, 55 year old people. Uh, I know about people who was dying, who was shouting because they were missing air and they could not breath and the hospital could do not, not more than give it them oxygen and uh, this is the situation it's really a, a not a human situation and what i said to the to the journalist to paolo and in, in the interviews you saw is that we are in uh, world war three and this is absolutely what i think i saw scenes in the hospital who are like uh, war scenario like uh, wards, plenty of uh, patients on the bed, uh, some of them uh, dying there. Uh, and this is the real situation. In this case, the enemy is not another, uh, another country, but it's a virus, but it's a World War III. There is nothing to say against this. I mean, if you have someone who can come to the hospital here in Italy or wherever this uh, emergency is developing, you can say nothing different from this is a war scenario. Um, another question, because clearly we know that elder people are in the in the biggest danger because of the, uh, let's say, normal health condition, etc. But I also read uh, a couple of uh, um, uh, posts or whatever in social media, or so articles, that also younger people who are uh, already uh, affected in this day, they, they are suffering. So it, it's it's for me, and it's my opinion, but I would like to know, know your opinion as a doctor. It's, it's a mistake to think that we are safe and okay, maybe we won't die, but still it's a huge suffering. No one is safe. To be honest, you should talk to an epidemiologist uh, uh, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but I can tell you my experience and the experience from my colleagues in this area of Italy, which is one of the most with most cases. Uh, men are more at risk. Women usually are a bit more protected, which means they, they die less. Uh, the women at risk are mostly, according to what we saw, uh, women uh, uh, with a weight, uh, high weight, and uh, women perhaps uh, with hypertension in therapy for a high blood pressure. But uh, this is in terms of uh, survival. 
but in terms of uh, being uh, infected and having uh, the, the symptoms and potentially having serious symptoms and having to be admitted to the hospital, no one is safe. We had people uh, even much younger admitted to the hospital, even in intensive care, intubated, attached to a ventilator. So this is basically what's happening. Okay, I agree that many people can get infected and many of them will not die, but at the same time we have a high number of uh, deaths and even younger people can, can really get uh, sick very seriously. Do you have any idea maybe of these really, really high numbers in Italy? I mean, according to deaths, it's already the highest number, so higher than in, in China, for example. And also, I just uh, checked before I call, and uh, you have already known number. I'm talking about this 53,000 plus cases. So, and that, and and also, I don't. But what other thing I don't understand that you have the lockdown already since more like two weeks. I think yeah. uh, the complete lockdown, uh, and still the numbers are just getting higher and higher. Yeah. Also, the daily numbers. It's yes, scary. No. Uh, so in terms of number, as I said, uh, being not an epidemiologist, I don't care so much about the numbers, also because I understand that in this time of chaos, uh, it's difficult to get really accurate numbers. We will know them later on in one year or two years, perhaps. Uh, but these are not the real one, and this is a problem that also our government knows. It's difficult to test all the people and to test all the, all the bodies of uh, dead people. Uh, I don't know why we have these high numbers, which potentially are even higher and compared to other countries. The feeling is that someone said in other countries probably they, they, they tried to hide the, the cases and we were the first country declaring it at the, first, at, the, at the very first time I think everywhere in the world they thought oh look at the Italian people that they are dirty they have all this problem oh. while now I think uh, well in some countries probably yes but I fully understand but now I think we are an example because what happened to us I think can be an example also on how to move for other countries because this is a, pan a pandemic problem so it's a, a problem affecting everybody in the world and uh, related to the second question is also this point so now we are paying our mistakes uh, that we did two three four weeks ago so probably but it was difficult I don't want to blame anyone because probably at that time it was difficult uh, we didn't have the the means to understand what was going to develop and, and this is Italy also was how, the first country yes, in, in Europe with, yes. with the high number this is also how many health professionals got infected because at the very first time we had the informative the information that this virus was, was arriving we didn't know much we said well but in China they are getting better so we didn't we didn't protect ourselves we didn't we didn't have a strict guidelines on how to protect so we went to a lot of cases me and my colleagues who were let's say cardiac case or respiratory case and actually they had an infection and so this is how some of my colleagues got infected at, at the very beginning because healthcare professional infection is a, a serious matter that is going on now less but still we have this problem the problem is that if healthcare professional got in, get infected the rest of the population won't have uh, medical care so you understand this point so basically i think now we are paying uh, the fact that we didn't lock down uh, two three weeks ago and I believe, but this is my personal opinion, that uh, we would need a, a strong lockdown. Italy has been improving the lockdown throughout the, the weeks and uh, from yesterday night uh, also, the, uh, also the factories and everything else in Italy got closed other than the ones that are really needed for the population. So, of course, you keep open the supermarket, the pharmacies, what is needed for the population, but every, everything else is closed. I think there was a sort of fear to stop the economy, but there is no point in having this fear because if you have no population because your population is dying uh, who, who will use the money this is uh, something strange to me so the and my opinion and also the suggestion to other countries and to other government is to be brave and to take the right decision now because the stronger you are now the better it will be the outcome and the quicker it will be the good result and you will be back to the to the economy as well. So at the end of the day, even the economy will be better if you close everything which is not needed now. So this is basically my point. And I saw that in some countries who are facing now difficult time, they didn't follow our example. I mean, we were in, an example in understanding what was going on and that a delay could be serious. And I hope that some other countries would have 
took the right decision to, to close immediately rather than waiting. But what I see is that some other countries waited too much. Yeah. Another problem that we had in Italy and we are facing, and this was also part of the interview that you saw on the Italian newspaper, is that, uh, of course, the Italian government didn't put in place a military regime. And so we, we still didn't have, uh, we still don't have the soldiers on the streets. So what happened in Italy, not many people, but some of the people, but you know, you have a big country. So even if it's a minor percentage, it's still many people. Uh, because the, the government said, OK, you can go for a walk if you are alone, you can go for a run if you are alone. If you give permission to some people, there will always be a minor part of the population in every country who will try to be the smart one, uh, the, the one that I don't care. So we had people in the parks playing football, we had people running together, people meeting up on the benches, on the streets. Uh, and this was totally stupid. So I think now also the Italian government is uh, uh, putting more pressure on this and the police is, do the police is doing some checks uh, and I hope they will keep these people very strongly. Now, you want, uh, you want the, the, the country, the government to take care of your health because you are part of a community which is your, your country and your government, but you don't want to deal with the, with the decision of your government for the health of everybody. This is totally stupid in my opinion. I think your first advice is completely clear. Like stay home, everyone in every country, uh, not just in, in Europe, because okay, now China is, looks like getting better, but now we know about Europe, now we know about yeah. uh, America, US, Argentina, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my last question, what do you think about wear a mask or not wear a mask if you don't have symptoms and you feel uh, you are not affected? Because honestly, also in my country, uh, the government says that no, if you are healthy, but how can I know whether I'm uh, infected or not, even if without symptoms? Uh, so don't wear a mask because uh, it's not useful. Don't wear a mask is a suicide. It's a mass suicide at this time with this pandemic uh, issue going uh, through the world. Uh, you said China and I say it, but China now is, uh, uh, is scared about a possible second peak because you are not safe for a second peak if the virus is still around in the world. And we should remember that the Spanish flu at the beginning of the 20th century had three peaks in two years. So imagine what it means to have three peaks in two years for the next two years and what would be our life. So perhaps it's better to do a sacrifice now for a longer time, let's say a few weeks now, rather than having to run with this uh, virus uh, around. And uh, regarding the mask, uh, absolutely, as I said, there are a uh, a really high number of uh, asymptomatic cases or cases in which you think, oh, it's a normal flu, oh, I went out and it was cold, so I don't think I have the coronavirus. Uh, and these people is potentially, uh, is potentially infecting other people, who is potentially infecting other people. So I think uh, putting the mask, it's a protection for yourself, first of all, of course, plus uh, as perhaps uh, your government said, I don't know, the Italian government is stressing it, wear the mask, wash your hands uh, uh, many times, uh, don't put your, hand in your, your hands in your face, uh, uh, so these uh, don't stay close to other people, even if you are the, your relatives, try not to stay too, so close. Uh, but also it's a matter to protect the rest of the people, because if you are not, imagine also from a, you know, when I give you a real example, perhaps it's more hitting, it's more uh, stress, it's more stressful for the people to listen and to understand. I attended two or three cases in which I went to the, to the places of uh, people around 70 year old, 75 year old, who, in my opinion, are, are not old. Nowadays, 70, 75, taking one medication or two, they are not old, they are autonomous, they can do their normal life. They, could in, they got infected by their, they, by their uh, son. You know, one, of the, one or two of this family told me, uh, my son came to visit us after two days, uh, he, got, he got a flu and now we are like this. So the son now is much better. In these two cases, the two sons are better. But in one case, the mother, in one case, the father, they, I had to admit them to the hospital and potentially they could die. So uh, not wearing a mask is very dangerous for the rest of the people. If you don't care for the rest of the people, imagine for the rest of your families. Many cases of people, members of the family infected by the younger, by the younger one in Italy. So this is a real, uh, a real issue. Uh, thank you for your time, Michele. I really hope that uh, 
at least we can uh, reach a couple of more people who still maybe uh, haven't understood yet how serious the situation is. Uh, take care, please. We try. <laughs> we, we need you anyway, not just the MotoGP. So, uh, and I hope that it's it's gonna finish soon, and maybe we can avoid uh, the second and the third peak, as you as you mentioned. I I hope so. I'm not sure, but I hope so.